the first question that I would pose to the group of you uh, has to do with science and scientists' relationship to the crew. I'm wondering um, what lessons might have been learned with regard to performing science in space. Before I address that directly, I want to want to start with something that you may have a misimpression of from the very beginning, which is people talked a lot about as if the five space agencies in 15 countries were some exclusive club that was closed to others. And it's in the research and the science that you see how open the space station is. So those 15 nations have cooperated internationally all over the world. We have over 103, I think maybe 106 now, countries and areas that have participated in the space station. So it's like those 15 nations came together and built a super highway in space, and that infrastructure was then available for everyone to partner on and to use. And so that, that connects both to our science and to our inspiration. The way that that then plays out as we have science being conducted on the space station, we have crew members that are trained, they meet the scientists ahead of time, they understand what their objectives are. We've had a number of cases where crew members have seen something that didn't look right, requested a video con, had an extra conversation and had those eureka moments. And so you really see that interchange between scientists and the astronauts in carrying out the research and that's led to a number of our discoveries. Terrific. John? Thank you. And, and as uh, Justin mentioned, I am recently retired from NASA, so my answers are now unencumbered. <laughs> uh, I think the, the space station and the chance uh, for we ground-dwelling scientists to interact with, with our counterparts, our surrogates on the International Space Station has been very helpful. And I'm thinking particularly in regards to the human research, which is uh, unlike me, is uh, encumbered by the fact that the operators are the test subjects and they have the right of refusal and the right of privacy, which can affect not only data collection, but data publication, which was a, what you all expect to see from experiments in the space station. I'm very pleased with the degree of participation by the, the surrogates, by the astronauts in our uh, often very invasive and always very obnoxious investigation. And I, anybody here that's a life sciences investigator that doesn't agree with me, you're wrong. <coughs> yeah, uh, the gentlemen in front are, are discussing the fact that they are often obnoxious investigators. But I think we've we've learned a great deal. We've learned a great deal about the human uh, human capabilities in space, not just the the, the uh, operational capabilities, but the potential. Uh, benefits uh, to, uh, well, insights into human physiology uh, from space flight. And I guess, I don't know if it really addresses your question, but the point I wanted to make is uh, the more we learn, the more we realize that, that the humans are, I think, at least in my perspective, well adapted to continuing uh, in space flight, especially in weightlessness or microgravity. Uh, it seems like the, uh, the, the DNA encoding and the, and the neural networks and all that kind of stuff adapt very nicely to the effects of space flight. So, uh, I, will, I will simply close by saying that every time I have posed a hypothesis for investigation as a scientist, my hypothesis has been exactly wrong, and I've been able to learn more things about we humans from the experience of space flight. Yeah, I, I'm still employed by ESA, but my answers are absolutely open, like, like the European Space Agency is, I, I must say, it's very, it's very easy to express your opinion inside, inside of ESA, so please, you can take this uh, seriously. What, um, in my field of work, communications and the public relations and the, the outreach, we don't really have a choice. The, the world is changing, like, like you said, also Jean-Jacques, the, the world's changing. So the solution we are applying today, even if they are very successful, and we look at the a successful a story behind us, we, we can't continue applying them. We have to change. Because if the world's changing, meaning that the challenge is on you, we, we've been hearing this uh, in, in the conference, so what does that mean? It means we need to find new solutions. And we are here, we are too old for this, so I'm sorry guys, it's just, it's not us to find them. So what do we need? We need to find others, younger guys, younger, uh, younger people to, to find these solutions. How do we get them to them? We need to create positive role models. We need to, I think also, cultivate curiosity as as a virtue, as something that, that is fun to do. And we need to inspire them. And guess what? ISS astronauts, they do that. And they do this for free. 
I started 2007 at, uh, at ESA, and this was right after the flight, uh, the, the long duration mission on the ISS, which was the first one of the ESA astronauts. And this was Thomas Reiter, who is in the room here. <laughs> yes. So, at that time, the, this was also the start of social media. Did we start to use social media? No. Because we have a lot of member states, we are big institutions, we need to uh, get, have time to adapt to the tool, to trust um, the, the users as well, and to find our way uh, there. So after a couple of years, we started to use them. We had a new generation of, of astronauts. And they, indeed, stayed up longer at night, went to bed later, to do what? To communicate with people. To fulfill the mandate of the agency, which is create positive role model, inspire people, and cultivate this career. So indeed, I'm saying this, we, you get this with ISS astronauts. So yeah, it's, a, it's a longer response, sorry for that. No, it's Just great. No, no, it's, per it's, it's perfect, absolutely. I just want to follow up a little bit uh, on, on some of what I was uh, getting at with that question. I'm curious uh, about when, when we perform science on the space station, for example, if, if we use our, our experience with ISS, as some sort of guide, you know, that the way in which experiments are designed on the ground by scientists to be carried out by people who are not, may not, or definitely are not specialists in those kinds of science. I'm curious about your experiences in doing that and what you think that can teach us for future scientific work carried out in space. Well, I think one thing that we've learned um, in human space flight over the last 20 years is that it's much harder to do experiments in space than you think. Your instincts about all kinds of basic processes are wrong. So fluids don't go the way they're, you think that they're going to. They don't adhere in the vessels the way you think that they're going to. So we've actually had a growth of a set of expertise in how to take an experiment on the ground and translate it into space. In general, a lot of our scientists on the ground don't know how to do experiments in space anymore. And that's one of the big changes that's happened with the space station. Instead of being a very small elite group of scientists who are kind of tuned in to their local space agency and know how to get a, get a project in space, now it's opened up much more where there are a number of different private companies that specialize in helping researchers do things and understand how to take a cell biology experiment and do it successfully in space without all the cells dying. And as we have that happen more and more, what we're learning is that we're never going to finish the experiments on the space station like Scott implied. Now we'll finish the set that we selected today and we'll select several more generations because we have probably a decade ahead of us to use this amazing facility. Fingers but at, crossed. But at the same time, we are creating the infrastructure and the motivation, the ability to keep doing research in low Earth orbit forever. And in fact, we're creating the scientific demand and the knowledge to, to keep using that capability in low Earth orbit forever. It won't be big like the space station, I think. It will be, they'll be smaller, they may be commercially operated. There are a number of companies, as, uh, as Nicola referred to, that are doing business with big space agencies in a very different way. So it may be that someday a scientist just gets a grant from their regular science foundation, not from a space agency, or from a corporate R&D interest, and they fly their cells into space by purchasing access to a space flight from a private company that's operating that platform. They might be operating that platform for additional reasons, such as tourism or advertising or something else. But the fact that when you go into space, you can take gravity out of the equation and you can study physics in a way you cannot study, you can't do the perfect controlled study without gravity and physics on Earth, and you can't do a controlled study without gravity on life sciences unless you go into an environment like spaceflight. And so we're only at the beginning of understanding how to do these experiments and being shocked by some of the amazing results. And so there are there's a hundred years of experiments ahead of us, I believe. John? <coughs> Just a <clears throat> As you were asking that question, I was formulating an answer, and then listening to Judy's response, I changed my answer at least twice, <laughs> thinking about it. <clears throat> yes, she does. <laughs> keeps me spinning. Um, I, the, my first brief answer, I think, was getting to the point you were, you were addressing, and that is, uh, at least in the area of human physiology, 
The last thing we want is for astronauts to get smarter about the experiments in space. We don't want their help changing them in space. And in my experience on the space shuttle missions, the best human research subjects were the test pilots who opened the checklist, followed it, closed the checklist, and put it away. When you have the PhDs, they will read the experiment and give you a better investigation, which then cannot be compared to anything else. So in, in terms of pre-flight data collection, which is your baseline, you can't compare the in-flight result. And then there's no comparison between this PhD astronaut's better experiment and that PhD astronaut's different better experiment. So in terms of human research, human physiology, uh, being a dinosaur, I liked, I liked it best when they followed instructions. Uh, but, and, and you said some other things that I'm trying to recall now, which were brilliant, and I wish I could repeat them and plagiarize them. Um, but do you think, do you think uh, that it's, it's worth engaging more with crew prior to launch on particular experiments? Well, to, the if, human, if they do have insights? Uh, we would love to, and we are not permitted to, because the astronauts' time for ISS uh, before flight is so heavily constrained that we barely have enough time to do the minimum required training for the investigations that we do. I guess one of the other points I wanted to make is I long for the day when commercial spaceflight makes it possible for the professor and his or her students and postdocs to go into orbit for a day, a week, a month, and do true human physiology as well as microgravity sciences and other things. So only then can we understand in statistically meaningful senses what happens to, to biological systems in space. And the other thing I did, I now had a chance to think about, Julie mentioned, we talk about our, our baseline condition. It may be that the zero gravity state is truly the baseline and that gravity is the perturbation. Wouldn't it be nice to have a generation of biological specimens, or dare I say a generation or two of people who have been raised in weightlessness that you can then expose to one G or one sixth of a G or one third of a G and understand the effects of this very novel uh, uh, input, because at least in terms of the research that we're doing, it takes a, a finite amount of time for the 1G adapted animal to adapt to the zero gravity state. So it's not like zero gravity for anything less than three months is a normal state. It's, it's still a transitional state. Wouldn't it be nice to have uh, that opportunity in the future? I look forward to that in the future, uh, future generations. John, I, I, I love that you just revealed to us that at heart you're a mad scientist. <laughs> um, if, 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 I, if I can just follow up on uh, what Jules was saying uh, a little bit ago uh, with regard to outreach, I think that you have some other insights um, with regard, for example, to uh, particular ESA missions uh, and how, um, how the crew has helped to create a wider sense of interest and engagement you know, like I said before, um, we, we have now what I call the, the tool of massive fulfilling of our mandate, which is to share uh, as much as possible uh, with, with a wider audience, with our contributors, the, 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 our mission, the impression of the mission as well, and also to listen if we can. And like I said, back in 2007, it was more and more, it was easier and easier to, to share, but it wasn't so easy to listen. And now we have the possibility to have a real dialogue. Um, in, in 2015, uh, Tim Peake uh, flew on board the space station for six months, and he, we managed to share with the help of the UK Space Agency as well, we managed to, to, uh, to, to share the mission with 1.6 million children in the UK. So one third of every school in the UK participated in the education program. So th there's, a, there's a very um, famous competition in the UK called 500 words, it's run uh, by the BBC every year. And the Oxford University is making an analysis of the, uh, the submission. This is kids writing a story, any kind of story in 500 words. And I invite you to read the analysis of the Oxford University of that. And you will see the year after Tim Peake's flight, a lot of the stories were about space. And they found out that the level of vocabulary had increased because teachers in the classrooms start talking about space. They start using uh, complicated words that that's, um, they can now because the kids are motivated to listen to these complicated words because they can relate to a cool story, to an astronaut in space that talked to them. They feel a connection to an actual human being yes, absolutely. that they can relate to up there. Yeah, and uh, so that's, that's the report from 2015. You know, these kind of things take time. I'm, I'm also, I'm, because I'm French, I'm European first, but I'm also French. 
I had this kind of challenge with my family and friends before the mission of Thomas Pesquet, our last uh, ESA astronaut to be returned from space. We have now Alexander Gerst in space. A lot of my family and friends told me, no one cares about space. Astronaut, no one cares. Forget it. But I knew because we've done the missions before in other countries, and it's been a great success. It's a great success, similar to what we had in the UK. So. I'm, I'm waiting this report. Now, I don't want to take more time because we need to involve people, so we will. I'm happy yeah. to take all the rest of my time for you guys to share, to challenge me as well. If you have questions, these kind of things, I'm happy to just Yes, thank, that. thank you, Jules, that's, that's great. We act, I can see a hand already. I'll take it, uh, two hands. We'll, uh, we'll take some questions, but then we also want to leave a little bit of time at the very end for one final question for all of the participants who are here. Uh, so let me um, first offer you microphone in terms of uh, the expanding the opportunities you had mentioned the the, the, the challenges of the PhDs with the uh, look for that perhaps the better idea but there seems to be the opportunity for an increased level of telescience and in situ science as opposed to batch return work and the uh, the availability of additional autonomy you folks see a future in terms of expanding the ongoing research both on station and with uh, you know, commercial opportunities to leverage and take advantage of that. Yeah, we definitely see that happening. Um, you know, early in the space station, uh, especially before assembly was completed, the crew time was so limited and the training was so intensive because they had to learn how to assemble the space station. They were primarily construction artists uh, first, and then carrying out the research was secondary. So people got used to access to the science being very difficult. And what's happened now that we're in our research mode, where that's the prime purpose, and the crew members have the time to train, to learn about the experiments, there's more interactive exchanges possible. And then, of course, we'll, we will then transition to a period when uh, when the number of people going into space perhaps even expands more with commercial crew, commercial cargo, um, and maybe the transition of low Earth orbit aside from just government space stations, but to a, a broader mix in that low Earth orbit economy. So through those, all of those transitions, you get more and more access to innovative work and innovative approaches. At the same time, our technologies on Earth for communicating, for video conferencing, for uh, dual virtual reality presence, all of those things keep adding to the tools that we have at our disposal in orbit to have people more present while they're doing their experiments. So all of those things come together really nicely in making it an innovative platform. Okay, uh, one more question. Hi, my name is Grant Emery. My question is, what would you recommend should be done to continue these experiments if U.S. funding for the station ends in 2024? So the, the first thing I want to say is you hear U.S. funding ends for the space station in 2024, and there's nothing that has ever said that. There was a president's budget submit that doesn't cover 2024 or 2025 that said it would be great if direct funding would cease, meaning direct funding for NASA civil servants. But that doesn't mean NASA stops funding the space station. In fact, it, that's, those same documents say that it's a NASA policy goal to enable low Earth orbit to become part of the U.S. economy. So you don't have to think too creatively to realize that that means that does not mean putting the space station in the ocean. That means continuing to work with the partnership to be innovative in, in low Earth orbit, and that's what NASA intends to do. Okay. Let, me, let me just add one more <clears throat> thing to that. Even, even if ISS ends up in the ocean, that does not mean there will not be private space stations in orbit, and it's entirely possible that NASA which will continue funding research, life sciences otherwise, may become a, a customer on Bigelow 4 or, or Blue Origin 12 at space station and rent a locker, rent a room, you know, rent a module, rent a wing for you know, a month or a year or permanently. Thinking about 20 years of the modules being up there, 18 years of continuous habitation um, on November 2nd, um, humans are starting to become a space species. And um, I'm wondering what you, if you have any reaction to that concept of us being a space species, and also possibly about public awareness of that. So I don't know if we'd like to start. Yes. I've been a space species for 13.5 billion years, because the Big Bang is in our 
in, in uh, outdoor that we have in us. We are speci uh, spacious because we have also material from the inside of stars. And this we have learned also thanks to uh, science, but also science to investigation. Some of them have been sent to space. So it's nice to get <coughs> sent to this uh, space asset, knowledge on ourselves. And we are really a space issues. We have been spending some of our time in zero G. Some of this material came from zero G. So we, so we have also to include all of this and making the public aware that it's our origin and it's our destiny also to move also to this world where we come from. That's from the science of the oh. Yeah, we're in this uh, space, uh, sorry, space species, but, uh, but at the same, th those people who are here, I think uh, you all are very interested in space, that's why you are here. But uh, in the world, there are so many, I don't know, people, industry, who are not connected to space. And uh, there are very smart people or company, technologies and uh, all kinds of uh, assets that we have not utilized to expand our activities in space. So I think it's uh, right now, uh, space station has been going very well for the last 20 years, but I think we should uh, attract more industry, more people, more scientists who, have, who are considered in a conventional sense non-space type industry so that they can participate more. And uh, in Japan, we have been uh, uh, doing a program called uh, Space Exploration and Innovation Hub, where uh, JAXA experts will work with uh, non-space industries to come up with a new technology, like in a low TR technical uh, technology readiness level five to six. And uh, the outcome should be uh, application to the space exploration, but at the same time, the application should be the, uh, the ground industry. For example, uh, some companies have been working with JAXA to develop a lightweight crane uh, uh, system, for example. Or a Sony Computer Laboratory uh, is uh, working with JAXA to develop uh, like uh, laser communication technology that they will use for the ground, but at the same time, we, JAXA, would like to use it for the exploration. So I think it's very important to attract uh, many conventional non-space uh, entities, uh, and I think we're in the process of doing that. I, I might chauvinistically say also the inclusion of other disciplines besides the STEM fields. I can see Alice might be chomping at the bit to say that. Yeah, well, so just thinking about how, for example, not just um, the physical sciences, uh, the uh, social sciences, the arts, the humanities, how all of these uh, areas can engage with space because all of that, I think, personally will enrich um, our future in space. Um, so, but Alice, if you want to say something. Uh, responding to the idea that we're um, uh, becoming a, a, a space adapted species, since the time, from the time of our birth, everything, that some of the things that little kids love most to do is to be thrown up in the air and caught. They love playing in a playground full of swings and things that turn and things that expose them to different kinds of gravity. Adults go to amusement parks and go on roller coasters and drop towers. Some of the tallest drop towers in the world aren't scientific experimental ones at universities, they're in amusement parks. So all the time we're playing with our own gravity, we're adapting ourselves to variable gravity environments. So I think uh, it's not just star stuff, it's not just that we've been part of, um, been in space, traveling on spaceship Earth for, for, for 3.6, million years, if we want to look at the emergence of, of humans. Um, everybody's playing with gravity from the time they're born. So I think that's part of our adaptation to space. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, I think if you look back at history as well as looking forward, uh, you know, it's the nature of human beings to explore, whether that was exploring the oceans in the 13, 14, 1500s, whether it is exploring space today. But as humans, it's also our nature to colonize and become a part of those new environments that we open up. Sometimes here in the space community, we get so focused on the next destination and, and being the first to a place. We get focused on that hardware and the, on that technology challenge, and we forget that we also have the obligation to build the infrastructure and the economic foundations of that expanded presence. And so I think the true legacy of ISS a hundred years from now will be that it is the way that we brought low Earth orbit into the commercial sphere and made that a place that humans could be. Then that we used it, used our partnership as a whole, and used those technology gains to go on to the moon, not just for the first visit, but to stay. 
and use that as our stepping stone into the solar system. Jacques, yes. May I introduce another perspective? Um, we are in Germany. I know. Um, we are in Germany, and a very famous German philosopher, Helmut Oeser, wrote a very nice paper in 1934, before, before, before space age. And the title of this paper is Earth Does Not Move. And uh, it's not against space adventure, it's in another perspective. And until now, we are terrestrial people. And for me, ISS, yes, is belonging to space, but at the same time, is belonging to the greater Earth. And now, for me, the, the challenge is to build that, a greater Earth. And, and today, in fact, orbit around Earth is belonging to Earth more than to space. And this person, perhaps, not to contradict the idea of exploration, is to a sort of complementary view of the future in space. Some more words? Jean-Jacques, do you feel a, a space man? <laughs> yes, I am a space man, but I think that uh, it's time that we break the wall between space and, uh, and the real world. I think that uh, space is just a place where the uh, you humans have to uh, develop uh, their economy, their uh, life, and so on. And because unfortunately, and I, I say that because I am, uh, I am one of the guilty. Uh, we have lived uh, for much too long now uh, the space community behind our walls, and uh, considering that space was a very special place uh, compared to to the real world, uh, and that was totally wrong. And I think that it's time to uh, to consider space as just an extension of planet Earth. Uh, let's say Spe satellite communication is much more communication than space. Uh, it's part of our life on uh, on planet Earth, and uh, and the same. I am working on space resources. Uh, it's more resources than space. And and the day we the space community we understand that we are not. A special community and that space is not a special place we should have made a fantastic progress because as i said last week in luxembourg uh, just to the the yearly profit of total which is the old company yearly profit is much bigger than the total of public investment in space in europe that makes a big difference and the day we consider that we are not a special community we should have made a fantastic progress. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. You know, when, when we look at the Earth from space, you heard about the overview effect. We see the Earth is limited. It's thin. It's isolated. We can't avoid comparing Earth to our own spaceship. Earth is a spaceship. We are all crew members of that spaceship, not passengers waiting that somebody takes care of you. Crew member with the responsibility in conducting the ship. Conducting the ship means knowing how it works and then f respecting rules. To, to make it sustainable. So we are all already a space species, just being on a spaceship Earth. Thank you all. And again, our thoughts for our friends from Russia who couldn't come, Kornienko, Krikalev, Julie, Batarin Josek, but uh, they will uh, look at the video later. Thank you, thank you for your presence and the questions.